Well, welcome everyone to the uh, another episode of our Don't Waste the COVID-19 Crisis webinar series here at uh, Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment at Arizona State University. Uh, I'm really excited about today's topic. We're talking about the politi political economy of pandemics with David Stadelman and Gustavo Torrens. Uh, Gustavo is, at, is an associate professor at the Department of Economics at Indiana University um, and uh, is affiliated with the Ostrom Workshop, uh, which many of us have, have relations to as well. We're very excited to uh, continue to further develop those ties uh, and connect our groups. So I'm really excited to hear what Gustavo has to say. Gustavo is then going to introduce uh, Professor Dr. David Stadelman from uh, the University of Beirut uh, in Germany. Um, and without further ado, uh, Gustavo, would you like to, to take it over? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. It's a um, real pleasure to uh, be here, talk with you through, through Zoom. So let me start uh, sharing my screen. I have a very brief uh, presentation. Um, so um, let me briefly summarize how we started with this and what's what's the goal of this um, this uh, research group essentially. So it's um so I'm a, as I as, um, Mike just mentioned I am uh, the director of uh, the political economy program at the at the Ostrom Workshop. The program is focused on uh, institutional stuff related to long run economic and political development. Here you can find the link. Uh, and then when the pandemic started, we uh, decided to create a working group uh, to um, do research uh, related to uh, the, uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, David Stadelman uh, was um, already working on, on related stuff. So we uh, called uh, David uh, to take the lead and lead this uh, this group, and essentially what uh, David will mainly uh, talk in a minute is kind of a summary of what the group has been doing and what are the future goals of this group in terms of uh, research ideas and research questions. Okay, so what I'm going to do very briefly is kind of summarize a little bit the approach of the group and what type of research questions we are interested in, and then uh, David will start. With the, with the real stuff in, in a couple of minutes. So um, a couple of ideas that I think that maybe right now people are more willing to accept these ideas, but when the group started, they, they were kind of more controversial. But first idea is that we consider that pandemics are not only uh, epidemiological or biological events. Indeed, they generate a lot of impacts that they are worth studying from a societal, political, and economics perspective. And uh, on top of that, uh, using a resource-based and institutional-based approach to study these problems is for us the right approach, okay? So complementing what we know from uh, biology and epidemiology with a resource and institutional approach. So what we have learned from institutional economics and related areas is the right approach to think about interesting problems related to the pandemic. So let me uh, give you a very brief idea of what kind of things we are, are interested in this uh, research group. So um, this is kind of, a, to some extent, an arbitrary classification, but I think I find it useful. So um, one uh, area of interest is more on the microeconomics of enforcement and cooperation mechanisms relating to things uh, about the pandemic. So you can think about lockdowns, trust, but uh, in particular about immunity certificates, David, I'm sure will talk about that. In some sense, that was kind of the starting point of, of his research and, um, and, and, and I believe a very, important, um, a very important idea. But you can also focus more on what you can call macroeconomics aspects related to changes in redistributive politics or the way uh, fiscal policy or government debt is handled associated with the pandemic. So there are some interesting also resource allocations issues that are more commonly known as macroeconomics, okay? 
And there is also a very interesting thing to consider related to, well, the political economy of rational behavior versus more kind of panic-based behavior during emergencies or crises in general. Um, but what I think is more, uh, is the most interesting part of this, uh, of our research interest is, uh, related to this working group uh, has to do with institutional development. So again, we care about uh, how institutionals emerge, how institutional persist, how institutional institutions change. So we ask uh, questions about institutional development related to the pandemic. And I'm just giving you here a couple of examples. So for example, what type of institutions should we build to deal with a pandemic, okay? So we can think about the future that this is not just one case that we will have to handle similar situations in the future. Well, what kind of institutions we should build or organizations and institutions to deal with, with these type of situations. And another more specific question, just to give you an idea in, in which direction we, we are thinking. So imagine that sometimes emergencies require some temporary concentration of power, okay? But well, you, we know that temporary concentrations on power, power could be dangerous, no? So how can we reuse uh, all the things that we learn about check and balances and uh, separations of power, but apply to the design of institutions related to the way we handle pandemics, okay? Just this is kind of a, to some extent, the tip of the iceberg, of the iceberg of the research ideas that we are trying to um, address in this uh, working group. As, as you imagine, uh, started a little bit um, more disorganized and slowly as the uh, research grows, I think it's uh, the research agenda is getting more, more coherent. So um, I think I will stop here. Um, I will pass um, uh, on David. David will be talking more about a summary of the, um, of the things that we have uh, already accomplished, but more interesting, I think, the new projects that are work in progress and uh, new potential ideas to continue this, uh, this research group. So thank you very much. And David, um, I think uh, you, I will stop sharing my screen and then you can start sharing yours. Unmute myself. So hello, everybody. There we go. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a true pleasure for me uh, to present uh, what we have been doing so far uh, in the workshop, uh, uh, especially uh, in the context uh, of uh, political economy of uh, pandemics. Uh, so thank you, Gustavo, for a very nice introduction. <laughs> so what I will uh, do uh, in the next um, 15 to 20 minutes is that I will quickly show what type of output we have already achieved so far. So I will talk about some of the work that we have been doing and I will then also introduce some of the approaches that we are currently following and some of the working papers that we are developing and then we will open for a general discussion. So there are numerous things that we have been doing. I started already prior to the lockdowns actually to <laughs> to work only on COVID uh, and together with Gustavo, uh, Dean Luca, uh, etc., we organized uh, this uh, working group uh, and we've also tried to include other researchers, uh, so colleagues from us uh, from Australia, uh, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, uh, etc. So the group is now pretty big. It's of course uh, loose because different people are different, uh, interested in different topics. Uh, so let me carry you through uh, uh, very briefly. So. That's quite some output uh, since uh, March, uh, because I think we realized very quickly that this is going to be, well, probably the biggest crisis or hopefully the biggest crisis of our lifetimes. I don't want to have another crisis like that, uh, I think. So uh, here is just a short overview uh, on some uh, of the articles that have already been published. So um, 
Lynn Luke has published uh, uh, something uh, spreading like wildfire in regulation. Uh, together with uh, collaborators from Africa, we have been looking at secondary effects of lockdowns uh, in Africa. That's a short paper in uh, Economics Bulletin, uh, where we mainly focus on economic effects, institutional effects, but also uh, on uh, educational effects. Uh, schools are, for example, still closed in Kenya. And the whole stuff actually started with um, a certain idea that uh, uh, you have the possibility to certify uh, immunity and you can view individual immunity as a resource, uh, as a resource that can be used uh, in the sense that once you have acquired a certain uh, level of immunity due to infection, of course, the probability that you will reinfect twice is very low. If you are looking currently at the vaccines, uh, then uh, the probability to reinfect is also around 5% for, for the best uh, vaccines. So uh, if uh, you compare this uh, with convalescent immunity, probably we are in roughly the same uh, range. We then extended it, uh, uh, looked at confidence also in healthcare systems and mobility. So. Uh, uh, co-authors in Australia, they gathered great mobility data very, very early during uh, the first uh, lockdowns. I think we were the first group there too, uh, with such a large um, set of data regarding mobility. We then looked at risk attitudes. Uh, this was just recently published in scientific reports. Uh, Plus, uh, again, with other co authors, we looked at emerging markets. And of course, there are several smaller papers. Well, not of course, but uh, there are several smaller papers, uh, some papers in Revise and Resubmit, and a large set of uh, media articles, particularly in uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, which is the domain uh, where I'm relatively active in and where uh, two other of my co authors are relatively actively uh, working. So uh, one nice success is so we always put humans into the center of our analysis because it's humans who react on incentives and it's humans who make decisions in uh, the end. Uh, and I think one uh, very interesting result from the first uh, lockdown, which came out relatively early in our research already in, uh, I think in May we had the first working paper on that is that risk attitudes uh, during um, the first phase of the pandemic and even prior to lockdowns uh, are very important. So uh, we clearly observe that uh, regions with different risk attitudes, uh, uh, you have clearly behavioral patterns that mobility is restricted, that they're far faster and far earlier and far uh, prior to the first uh, lockdowns. So even uh, up to two weeks prior to the first lockdowns, you observe that human mobility really came down in regions around the world uh, with uh, higher risk attitudes. And that's independent uh, of uh, economic and political institutions. And it's also independent uh, of other measures that were taken uh, by the government. This doesn't mean uh, that lockdowns were not important and they didn't contribute uh, to the, and that they didn't contribute to uh, reducing uh, the spread. But it's very interesting to see that risk attitudes uh, are extremely relevant too. And I think that's now partly what's plaguing Europe to some extent. People are not that afraid anymore. Thus, um, they do not adapt uh, themselves uh, to, to the risk. They think, uh, for some people now think, oh, for me, it's not so dangerous anymore. Thus, uh, they do not fully obey the rules. And now we are back with the second uh, lockdowns then. Uh, another nice paper also very recently published uh, looks at confidence uh, and state capacity, uh, but mainly focuses actually on confidence, but not in the government, but confidence in healthcare systems. Uh, and um, interestingly, in countries where you have large confidence of individuals in healthcare systems, uh, you observe uh, relatively small uh, mobility responses. So people, in a sense, independently whether they trust government, independently whether they have trust in institutions, they reduce their mobility, uh, they reduce the mobility less uh, if they have confidence in healthcare uh, systems. Uh, so that's also something uh, you need to take account of also for future pandemics, but also for the current uh, second and potentially third wave, uh, of course. Uh, 
A nice article also recently published uh, by Dean Luke uh, uh, makes comparisons between the spreading of uh, wildfires uh, from small pockets uh, uh, to uh, the current corona crisis. Unfortunately, uh, Dean uh, couldn't join us today as he is uh, traveling. So I go on. Uh, then uh, we have our starter paper, actually our starting approach, uh, which um, argued that immunity should be viewed as a resource and not as a resource due to herd immunity or for the government, but rather as an individual resource. So you have suffered from the illness, uh, but at least you gain something, you gain a certain level of immunity, not 100% immunity, not everything is certain, of course, but the probability that you are immune, at least for a certain period of time, uh, is relatively high. We, now, we know now uh, from uh, the latest uh, articles in science and also the New England Journal of Medicine that immunity lasts at least for four to five months put differently to the end of the respective study periods uh, that uh, the authors uh, there uh, were looking at. Uh, I think uh, certainly at least in Switzerland, Austria and Germany, we were uh, the first one uh, to propose that also in uh, policy circles and also uh, to governments. Uh, we were I think also relatively early uh, internationally and well, did it have uh, some effect? I think to some extent, yes, um, I can show you, though the law proposal didn't pass and it's in German, uh, of course, but actually there was a concrete law proposal in Germany to implement a form of immunity documentation, which was then uh, finally uh, stopped um, in uh, August, because in August, uh, the Ethical Council considered that the uh, evidence uh, for long term immunity was not yet sufficient. Uh, and as you know, once something is stopped, it's difficult to restart it. Uh, only a month later, uh, all the evidence emerged that immunity is uh, relatively long uh, term. But I think we had a nice influence and it becomes important again, uh, precisely due to uh, the possibility of having vaccines relatively soon. And now you can think, well, vaccines are a resource too, and they will be a scarce resource, at least for some months uh, to come. Hopefully next summer, uh, most people will uh, be uh, immune uh, due to artificial immunity, thanks to vaccines. But uh, of course, they will be scarce for some time. Uh, so the next step is now to say, well, listen, uh, those people who have already some antibodies and neutralizing antibodies, uh, they should not be given priority uh, uh, when a vaccine becomes available. And I think that's quite important. So uh, reliable estimates estimate that uh, in Switzerland, at least 18% um, of people uh, at the end of, um, at the beginning, no, at the beginning of, November, no, 10% uh, at the beginning of November were already infected and probably now uh, we will be at 15 uh, to 16%. So it's increasing relatively rapidly. In Germany, the number of uh, infected uh, previously infected and thus immune people is a bit lower. In Austria, it's also a bit lower, but it's increasing uh, throughout Europe. And I think uh, it's important to at least consider this perspective of immunity as a resource in order not to waste other valuable resources, which would be uh, the vaccines in this case. Now, I uh, do not present all of our papers, of course, and uh, I want to leave something for the discussion too, but I want to present some uh, selection of some of our current research uh, efforts, uh, which have not yet been published and uh, which we are still, which, which is still a bit open, which we are actually revising. So, we were interested, thanks to our Australian partners, uh, in differences how more or less globalized countries reacted to the crisis uh, and how this impacts with their state capacity, with their institutions. Uh, and in general, more globalized countries uh, were imposing travel bans a bit faster. However, 
if state capacity is relatively high, measured through uh, different indices, such as government effectiveness, the quality of government, uh, tax revenue, if you think that that's a form of state capacity, et cetera, et cetera. The results there show that globalized countries with at the same time relatively good institutions and high state capaci uh, capacity, they are not as quick uh, as impo to impose travel bans uh, and lockdowns uh, as uh, other countries. And I think that's also a nice uh, and interesting message. Then there is a huge uh, project which is still ongoing. Uh, I said we, we tried to organize a 24 hour day uh, already in. Uh, yeah, March, uh, April, uh, and perhaps some of you have received an email invitation um, that I sent out uh, in May. Uh, uh, at least I sent it out to 200, we sent it out to 200,000 people, to 200,000 researchers to be precise, uh, because we um, drew up a questionnaire uh, on different aspects of the crisis, uh, on immunity certificates, on uh, triage situations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was the survey was sent out to 200,000 um, email addresses, scientists uh, from May uh, to June, uh, and actually around 13,000 responses were collected. We are currently analyzing this huge data set. Uh, I think it's very unique. Uh, uh, some of the results are that most uh, scientists are relatively open regarding immunity certificates. Uh, they are a bit uh, risk averse when it comes to triage. Um, uh, plus, uh, they, the economists, um, and I'm an economist, they tend to see clear trade offs uh, between the value of saving lives uh, and the value of saving life years, uh, which is, I think, also a very interesting aspect, which has not yet received uh, enough attention uh, in uh, the scientific and in the economic debate. Uh, too. So the difference between saving life years uh, and saving lives. Uh, I jump over this one uh, so that we have a bit more time uh, to discuss. Uh, so that's uh, a project we are now uh, doing uh, in Bavaria actually where we were in lucky situation and my collaborator realized that actually that uh, we had, well, now I'm quickly talking about it because I think it's quite fascinating. We had a very nice uh, so difference in different setting where we can really exploit something because in um, in Bavaria, a mayoral election took place. Uh, and the first uh, ballot of the uh, mayoral election is always two ballots unless uh, one uh, candidate receives directly a majority of votes uh, in the first ballot already. But otherwise, there's a second ballot. And the first ballot happened uh, a few days prior to the lockdown uh, in Germany. And the second ballot happened afterwards, two weeks afterwards. It was a pure uh, distance, a pure postal, uh, uh, pure postal ballot. And we can try to exploit that uh, because we have really the lockdown in between. Uh, and what you see is that turnout increased by approximately 10 percentage points related or due to the lockdown. And it's uh, incumbents who profit from that. Uh, so people in uh, extreme situations uh, tend to go to the polls more often and then they vote for the existing incumbent, uh, which I think is quite an interesting result and maybe it generalizes. We are then going on further. So I'm hopping topic, uh, topics a bit. I hope it's fascinating for you too. I, I really like that. Uh, there are discussions in Europe, but maybe also in the United States, but in Europe, there are some discussions uh, on uh, financing uh, the crisis, uh, financing uh, the pandemic. Uh, and uh, from, large, from more left-wing uh, circles, uh, there is the proposal re-emerging that uh, one should use um, one of wealth taxes uh, in order to finance uh, the incurred, um, incurred debts uh, and the costs uh, related due to the pandemic. And usually the argument is um, that uh, these one of wealth taxes will be only levied on relatively rich people. So having uh, a wealth, um, having a fortune of over 2 million euros or $2 million. And the argument then is, well, actually, um, this would just hit the 
a minority, a clear minority of citizens. So there should be large uh, acceptance of such proposals. And of course, uh, there are not many situations where you can really find out what people really want uh, uh, and how preferences are uh, when people would be voting uh, for such a wealth tax, such a one of wealth tax. However, it's interesting to look at history and um, my colleagues from Switzerland pointed out actually there was a referendum in Switzerland almost a hundred years ago, so it's an old one, where uh, the Socialist Party at that time proposed a one of wealth tax for the rich only for roughly 0.6% of the population only, and it would have levied relatively uh, large wealth taxes starting at 8% for uh, fortunes over $2 million today, up to 30% for extremely large volumes. It was the only referendum on uh, one of wealth taxes that I know of, um, and it was the referendum in Switzerland which got the highest turnout, over 80%, and one of the most clear rejection uh, that uh, we have ever seen uh, in Switzerland. Actually, only 13% uh, of citizens accepted the one of wealth tax, 87% were rejecting it. So you see it here, uh, the rejection is uh, in uh, rather white tones and the acceptance would be uh, in red tones. And there was not a single district uh, where uh, more than 40% uh, uh, accepted uh, the referendum. And it's quite interesting. It's a fascinating thing which we are now exploring. There was a huge uh, campaign actually run against this um, uh, single wealth taxes uh, and well, it's um, commercials or advertisements in action. The main argument was always that it would destroy industry and that it's not credible to levy one uh, of uh, wealth taxes. And you see this nicely portrayed uh, in this um, in this commercial here. You see the three um, the three steps. It was in 1922 where the wealth tax would have just been 80,000, okay, which corresponds to roughly two million today. But then in 1926, uh, the spider is getting large. It's 25,000, and then it goes on until the spider eats uh, the um, uh, eats the capitalist, I guess, or eats uh, the citizen. So uh, these are also things, more macroeconomic aspects uh, that we are, are now looking at. Uh, plus, of course, always the institutional environment that's interesting for us here. Uh, direct democracy as an interesting environment. Otherwise, it's state capacity uh, that we are trying to investigate. Plus, uh, what um, are the institutional constraints and what are the political constraints uh, uh, that uh, prohibit certain solutions uh, to be realized. And at the same time, also uh, the question that we are also trying to explore in different other projects, well, how to limit uh, to some extent the large power that is gained by uh, the executive during that time. Uh, I don't think it's a large problem uh, in most uh, democracy, but it's still, uh, there are some uh, less stable democracies, especially also in Europe and of course also in South America. Uh, and that will be an interesting perspective too. And uh, I think I would open uh, the discussion now. Uh, we are uh, fine in time. So shall we open directly? Uh, yeah, we can do so. Yeah, I think that's great, David. Thank you so much. So if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and, and I'll forward those on to the, uh, to the panelists. That was a really great overview of a tremendous amount of work. Um, while we're waiting for the for the questions to start, let me just uh, start with a question for for you both. Um, I I saw I, I believe it was last week in the Economist had had a a series of articles on on COVID, and one of the um, articles was talking about economic models um and and kind of spats between the economists and the epidemiologists and i was wondering if you've been working with epidemiologists and what their perspectives are on on your work 
do you want to say something or shall I? I think you should go with this one, David, because yes. I, I, I know that you, you've been talking with <laughs> some uh, MDs. <laughs> We have not been directly working with epidemiologists, uh, but with numerous natural people from the natural sciences, uh, from uh, biology among others, uh, plus uh, also from uh, medicine. Uh, so um, uh, we have uh, team members among others from uh, the, uh, yeah, the the ESA clinics uh, uh, in Munich, uh, who inform us uh, on uh, the medical aspects, uh, and of course uh, we we are always highlighting trade-offs. I think that's the difference um, between us and also epidemiologists. Uh, I mean, when I talk to epidemiologists, you just, they will clearly tell you what you have to do uh, in order to limit the spread. It's quite clear. So uh, lockdowns mainly, plus a bunch of other measures. Uh, but then again, it's clear that lockdowns uh, also impose certain costs. And I think we as economists are the specialists uh, regarding costs. Uh, Plus, uh, they do not only impose economic costs, they also impose, of course, costs uh, on society. I mean, we all want the arts to flourish. We want kids to go to school, to get a good education, uh, etc. But at the same time, of course, we want to try to limit uh, the spread uh, of the pandemic. And then I think in the exchange, uh, you try to come uh, to, uh, to better solutions. But I think the trade-off aspects uh, plus the view that all resources matter. That's uh, what's dif differing between uh, economists uh, and uh, epidemiologists. Uh, but I think it's important to have, uh, to have this uh, exchange. Uh, and uh, we see numerous different uh, paths now uh, regarding the epidemic in Europe. So some countries Everybody's talking, of course, of the Swedish example, where uh, with a relatively disciplined population, a population that has a relatively high trust uh, in government, uh, a population that is the risk averse, okay, uh, you do not achieve necessarily the best results uh, in terms of uh, death rates, etc. But you achieve relatively good results uh, in such a population too. Now, of course, you could confront that to other Scandinavian countries or to Switzerland. But uh, I think it's uh, important to systematically think of incentives uh, of individuals, how they react. Uh, and we started doing that relatively early. Uh, this was the project which is now published in uh, scientific reports where we said, hey, the behavioral patterns that we seem to observe, uh, they do not really fit well with the first evidence that we have uh, that uh, the disease uh, is not only affecting the elderly, but it's mainly affecting the elderly. But we saw that mobility throughout all uh, the population far prior to the lockdowns was reduced, especially in risk averse uh, populations. And this is then what uh, led us to take the view, well, let's, let's think about the risk perceptions. Let's not only think about actual risk because people react on perceptions too. And so perceptions may matter. And of course, trust uh, will matter. So uh, uh, yes, uh, that's, uh, that, that was our approach. And I, I, I liked it. I think it's, for me, it's very important, not because uh, we are necessarily right with everything. Of course, we will be wrong in some aspects. But I think it is very informative uh, to know that during the first uh, phase of the pandemic in spring, March, uh, April, people complied to the rules due to their own risk perceptions. And now some people do not comply anymore because they see that their individual risk is comparatively low. Uh, and then they make parties. Hmm? Uh, so I think in the US, people were making parties even before. But in Europe, uh, or at least in Germany, everybody was behaving very well. And in Switzerland too, you know, uh, out of fear. And I think this is changing now. So this makes lockdowns far more costly uh, now than uh, during the first phase of the pandemic, at least that would be our argument.
me, I, I add something there. So it's, I, I agree with David. It's like uh, just one general point. I think it's it's important in these cases in, in which you have to work with uh, multidisciplinary things is like to focus to focus experts on the area of expertise. And I think uh, epidemiologists, they definitely, they are the, the, the people that we should listen about, well, how, uh, how uh, um, uh, um, uh, a disease spread and so on and so forth. But then, you know, people in social science are the ones, are the experts on decisions, how resources uh, should be allocated, on evaluating different opportunities, on organizations and institutions. So it's like, uh, it's like, listen to the right expert for one thing or for the other, no? and then combine the things. Uh, and then related to your comments about uh, models, uh, again, I may be wrong about this. My, my impression is that initially those, especially those formal models, we are pushing us more to a zero one situation, either full lockdown or uh, again, just open the economy, let this go as the flu. And I think as people learn more about this stuff, we came up with more kind of, hey, no, it's like, uh, it's, this is not like, you know, kind of, of a convex decision that goes to the streams. It's most likely mm -hmm. the optimal is in the balance there. Uh, and then we started to see more and more evidence in that, relay, in that direction. And then I believe that making the right trade-off is, uh, is kind of key here, okay? So that those are my two comments that essentially add on what what David was was mentioning. No? And then would you see that also uh, being affected by by specific contexts between countries or or even regions within countries, or urban and rural? Yes, um, of course we have not explored that uh, potential divide yet, uh, at least not directly. It's definitely in there as a control variable in our settings, uh, uh, but it's not yet directly expo explored. So, something that I, I think is interesting, uh, and I, I believe that we will end up discovering is that sometimes people jump into very easy conclusions. It's like one region or one country was doing well well, but come on, you need to see the whole path. It's mm -hmm. maybe you are just, uh, this is just working temporarily and then mm -hmm. you are postponing some of the cost of this, or maybe, I don't know, people start changing their, their perception of risk and then behavior start changing. So I think in some sense is um, kind of, I'm waiting to the end to come yeah. up with kind of a more informed, uh, full picture of, of, of what happened, no? Uh, because we start seeing this as like, oh, this country is doing well. Well, in three weeks, it's, no, they were just uh, going yeah. out of a wave and now they are starting to new <laughs> wave and then the, the numbers converge, no? That's, so, that's a very um, important point, I think. So, uh, I mean, our approach is always, let's think uh, from the end. So what is the equilibrium in the end? And in the end, uh, there must be some form of immunity. Uh, and that can be artificially induced through a vaccine, or of course it can be naturally induced, or realistically it's a mix of both, huh? to some extent at least. Uh, and then from this uh, equilibrium, uh, we try to come back. And then of course there are numerous questions. We didn't know in March how long would vaccine development take. So it was probably faster than anybody expected. But then again, some people said it will be even faster. Uh, then, um, uh, so th this is, of course, a certain game changer, but it doesn't change everything. Uh, and uh, I think we observed very well in Europe uh, that uh, all, not independently of what countries were doing, but um, the rates uh, of infections and also of deaths were coming down everywhere, uh, depending a bit on the measures, but they, they were coming down everywhere slower in Sweden, uh, but of course, uh, but uh, Yes, uh, now we are seeing uh, the rise again uh, of uh, deaths as well as of infections also everywhere and also just with a delay, you know. Uh, so uh, it seems to be uh, quite a weird situation. Yeah, that last part's been quite interesting here and I'm sure Gustavo sees this uh, as well uh, in Indiana, you know, uh, you can clearly see that it's all of the Democratic states that are doing a horrible job until it became all of the Republican states <laughs> who are doing a horrible job. And then it's back. And, and so the, the finger pointing has been pretty fantastic. 
Let me point out that the virus is not voting and doesn't know the difference between Republicans <laughs> and Democrats. I'm sure of that. <laughs> um, or borders, right? Uh, or borders. Yeah, for that correct. So it's, um, yes, I think it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, I think there are some surveys that show uh, some, you know, uh, partisan uh, preferences of people related to a potential policy, so there, there might be something, but something interesting is like when uh, when people start getting more information, some of these uh, views start converging. No? So um, again, uh, uh, it could be that you start with different priors, but then boom, you start you start converging, and then of course it's yes with these patterns, it's I, I believe well you have regional patterns on voting and probably overlaps or correlations with the way the virus spread from the coast to, to the middle of the country. And then boom, you immediately get some kind of a political pattern if you want to see, but it's, I think to some extent it's totally spurious, no? So essentially um, it's, it's, it, it's just like that, okay? So um, yeah, I, I believe that um, again, uh, I tend to think that we have relatively good frameworks in social sciences to uh, study kind of more like the, the equilibrium or the long-term pattern of things, okay? But it's much more complicated to come up with the whole path of how things will, will, will evolve. And I'm not talking about the epidemiology because I don't, I don't think that I know those models well enough, but my feeling is something that is happening in almost every science Good models, when you give time to reality to, to converge to something, but then not so good models if you judge the model to you are going to be matching every prediction every week, every day, no? So, um, but then yes, you know, media is publishing, well, they, they live in a, in a, you know, the new cycle that is whatever, a week or something like that, even sometimes even shorter, no? Um, but I think as, as scientists, we need to kind of calm down and think, well, um, what is the evidence here? What, is the lo what are the long run uh, outcomes after all these shaky dynamics in the short run kind of calm down, no, in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the only thing I would like to add there is that at the same time, and it, to be honest, this is kind of an open question to me. It's, we also think that a lot of uh, political changes comes in short windows of opportunities, no? So, and there you have some kind of problems because there are some things that maybe are relatively short time, they live just for a short period of time, that, but there may be enough to produce uh, political changes, no? And I believe especially in developing countries, okay? So for example, uh, we haven't explored this, but at some point we discussed with David, we thought that in many countries that were, you know, relatively weak democracies, many, uh, you know, wannabe autocrats, they would take this as a window of opportunity to, you know, size power or, I don't know, uh, make uh, um, elections less competitive, whatever you want, no? So it's, uh, um, again, I'm not sure because we haven't seen the, the, the data, but I think it's an interesting hypothesis to, to think about it. No? So it's uh, uh, what, what is going on with these more uh, weaker regimes and how they are reacting to this, uh, to this shock because at the same time, it seems that some concentration of power in these situations of emergency or, or power, or emergency of crisis, uh, they're useful, no? But then, you know, it's, you get it in an emergency and then they stay forever and that's a big problem. I don't think it's, a big, it's such a big problem for relatively well-established democracies, but maybe a problem for, um, for, um, for, you know, weaker political regimes, no? So we have a question here from, from Dane who says, you mentioned uh, lives and life's, life years and making trade-off decisions between them. Can you um, explain what that means to those that, that, don't, that, that don't know that? Yes, so of course I will try to. Uh, I mean, 
The virus is dangerous, um, but it's not only biologically dangerous or dangerous to people, but it's also, of course, infecting uh, society and it's also in effect, uh, infecting the economy. Now, uh, we know that numerous people uh, are dying due to the virus. Uh, and th the question is then, uh, well, when are these people dying? And now most of the people who are dying seem to be dying at a relatively old age. So uh, we, we know that the life expectancy is quite a good predictor uh, of uh, the share of deaths uh, between uh, different countries. Uh, plus, uh, of course, uh, there are preconditions, etc. that matter. So it's not the only predictor. But that means uh, that it's slightly different to other diseases, uh, other diseases which uh, also affect the young or diseases which affect children. You can best see that perhaps uh, when you're looking uh, at the African continent. Uh, I mean, there you observe very low death rates, uh, which is probably related uh, to the age structure, plus uh, potential uh, Im immunity uh, due to either previous infections or to, uh, to similar infections. But at the same time in these countries, we have uh, numerous diseases which threaten uh, particularly children, such as uh, malaria, of course. And now if a child die, dies, uh, it's a tragedy. If an old person dies, it's also a tragedy. But numerous people would say there is a difference uh, because the life expectancy of the child would be far longer than the life expectancy of the relatively old person. And when you then look at the number of life years saved, uh, you may say, well, actually, if we have very scarce resources only available, we should rather try uh, to shift the resources uh, to the child. So I think uh, uh, in Africa, there, that's relatively clear. But of course, it always holds, uh, at least the general thinking. There may be a trade-off uh, in saving lives uh, and saving life years. Uh, you cannot save uh, lives forever. But you can try uh, to give uh, more uh, weight on saving life years. Uh, so in that sense, there is a trade-off. If you extend it, uh, and if you are becoming you now a pure purely economic, then we know uh, that quite a good predictor of a long life uh, is a stable economy that is growing because you need to find the health system too. So you could make the argument uh, that if you uh, threaten longer run growth uh, due to institutional changes, power grabs, uh, etc., then this may actually cost <laughs> more lives in the longer run, plus a lot of life years too, because you are not extending life expectancy anymore. So that's the general thinking that we have there. We also ask this for this trade-off uh, in our survey actually, whether one should, so let me, let me show this to you, perhaps that's interesting. Uh, where have I got it, uh, here. So um, that was one question, um, COVID-19 main, uh, can you see it? COVID-19 mainly affects the elderly. Which of the following options would you prefer? A multi-billion dollar uh, package to save a thousand people who would have died two years sooner without the package or a multi-billion dollar package to save 500 people who would have died 10 years earlier without the package? Now you can already calculate the number of life years or uh, some combination of the two. Uh, and we are then interested uh, how different scientists from different disciplines uh, evaluate the question. So um, we want to elicit to some extent their preferences uh, with the question for either life years uh, or uh, lives uh, in general. We know that this concept is important, for example, uh, the EPA uh, in, um, in the United States, uh, similar to agencies in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, or by probably around the world, uh, is giving uh, monetary values uh, 
in the form of a statistical value of life. I think in the United States, it's currently 9 million, but they also give values per life year lost. And of course, um, regulation, etc., is then based uh, to some extent on these values. It's also important for climate change to know more about that, for example. Uh, so, you know, a lot of costs uh, from climate change uh, will probably come uh, due to lifetime that is lost. So we want to dig a bit deeper there uh, and also learn something for other fields or other questions. Uh, I also think that there was a short, so I, I did not relate that to uh, vaccines. My relation to vaccines, which was the question asked by Dan, uh, just saw it before, was that if you have already a certain level of immunity in the population, because some people are immune uh, as they recovered from the virus, uh, then these people should be tested for antibodies. These tests are available. If they have antibodies, uh, then there is no need uh, at least for some time to vaccinate them twice. And this can save resources, scarce resources uh, uh, for vaccines. So that gives you the chance to really vaccinate the population at risk. Those who have already antibodies, thanks uh, to prior infection, they are already protected to some extent. Uh, so it allows you prior prioritizing uh, vaccine uh, allocation a bit better. Uh, that was the point there. We have a, another question. From, thank you for, for that, David. We have another question from uh, David Manuel Navarrete. Uh, says China uh, and Vietnam reached an equilibrium really fast without vaccine or herd Im immunity. Do you consider these countries highly globalized? It's a good question, but I consider them highly global. So I have to check uh, the globalization in that. As you see, this is uh, our upcoming paper. It's our revisions. I have to see that I have a nice graph. Uh, oh, probably I can't, you can't see anything there. Well, immediately globalized uh, in the medium range for China. I can't find Vietnam probably in this uh, graph. No, I don't consider both of this. I would not have considered both these countries highly globalized. Uh, and it seems to be reflected uh, in the data. I'm not really sure uh, if um, China has reached uh, an equilibrium uh, really that fast. I mean, it seems to be quite a costly equilibrium. I'm fascinated by Vietnam, uh, to be fair, that uh, uh, there seem to be relatively few cases and very few deaths. Uh, interestingly, uh, so we should look at the case of Vietnam a bit uh, better, because interestingly, when you talk to epidemiologists uh, here in Germany or in my colleague in Switzerland, then uh, they never mention Vietnam uh, as a positive example, or uh, as an example at all. They always mention South Korea, interestingly, and sometimes also Japan, and sometimes China, which I don't think is such a good example. But Vietnam could be far more interesting. Uh, perhaps there is some... Uh, correlate to immunity there. Perhaps the population is very long. I would have to look uh, uh, at that a bit further. Regarding China, I don't think that that's a real uh, equilibrium uh, that you would want to sustain uh, as, uh, a, um, as individuals uh, in the population. Uh, because I mean, the virus can come back also to China relatively quickly and at least uh, one person, one uh, medical uh, doctor who I know who has good contacts to China. Uh, and I asked him, how can it be that there seem to be no more cases in China? He answered, well, uh, you know, uh, of course you can't trust all the data and at best you can trust the data from the cities uh, there. It's possible, but uh, in the countryside, uh, in the rural areas, uh, we do not really know. Plus, uh, the social control uh, seems to be quite tough uh, uh, in China, and you may go several times uh, into quarantine, uh, of course. Uh, uh, and I think that's not uh, the situation that we want to end in. If we are infected, uh, 
we go into quarantine once uh, and then hopefully we develop antibodies and then it's roughly done for us. Uh, uh, indeed, currently the regulation in Germany is that if you have been infected once uh, and you are a contact person to somebody else who is infected, uh, then you don't need to go into quarantine anymore because uh, the assumption, the pre-assumption is that you have antibodies. So in that sense, uh, we are far more uh, open, but uh, yes, uh, I, so I don't see this as an equilibrium. Uh, I rather think that the, the real equilibrium in China will come uh, when there is a really working vaccine uh, and I'm not sure if the Chinese vaccine is really working that well, but I'm not a specialist in vaccine development. I hope it's it's working. So I know we just have a few minutes left. Um, I'd be very curious in terms of at this point, you know, several months into this research and several months into uh, COVID, what are your what are your big uh, your your broad level takeaways? What are what are and and associated with that, what are your uh, recommendations? You know, if you were um, had the ear of the incoming uh, the president elect, what would you what would you tell them? Not an easy question. Sorry, no, no, to put not you an easy question. But <laughs> I think um, it's extremely important to put humans at the center of every decision making and to really take account that humans are very different uh, uh, from each other and they react differently and they have different aims, interests and preferences. Uh, and the problem with the pandemic is the externalities. Uh, similar problem as we see uh, in, other, uh, in other fields, be, let, let it be climate change. Uh, so it's uh, the structure of the problem is similar, but people uh, have different risk perceptions, people face different risks, uh, etc. Thus, uh, you need to take account of everybody. everybody. And that means that you have to uh, accept uh, certain trade-offs too. Uh, and it also means when you have this trade-off that you have to think of the resources that are available. Uh, you, can, you can't do good for everybody. You can't give uh, money for everybody to everybody because the stuff needs to be financed uh, at least at some point. Uh, uh, so you really need to take this broad perspective. Uh, I think that's essential. You could say you need to take a holistic uh, perspective uh, uh, and then you will make some errors, of course, but taking the holistic perspective, uh, I think that's uh, that's central, especially in the pandemic, and especially if you take want to take care of uh, individuals uh, and uh, face the situation. I, uh, people in democratic societies are not hurt, so are not cheap uh, or cows uh, that can be steered in one way or another. In autocratic societies, yes. Uh, but in autocratic societies, people are not happy. In democratic societies, people are happy, but that means that they are diverse. Right? They are running around. They are sometimes a bit crazy, you know, and they don't behave as not necessarily to their own best, but this needs to be taken into account that there needs to be some freedom. Uh, and you will not have a social welfare function in the end, but you can make a relatively good decision by taking a broad uh, perspective. And I think one thing that I would like to highlight there, if you are then thinking of commissions. So, so I've been in a regional commission uh, regarding COVID as an expert from the economic side. And I think it's really problematic if you have only one commission which has the task to take account of COVID because then this commission will always suggest lock down everything because they don't want to face risks and they want to solve the COVID problem. You would have need to have a commission that takes, that says you have to make this region or this country. Now I don't want to say great again, but you have, you have to make it great, you know, and you have to take account of everything. That's it. Yeah, I think I, if I, I have to answer, I think it's a very difficult question, but it's um, uh, thinking about the way you um, you deal with experts as whatever it's like, whoever is, is making calls is like, uh, be sure that you have a well-balanced uh, set of experts that you're not only listening to whatever economies, political science or epidemiologists, and also that you tell them, hey, by the way, 
you don't have weight one on the decision. You have some weight on the decision, but I'm also putting some weight on, 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 on other experts here. And the final outcome will, will be some kind of balance. And also explain to the population that there are trade-offs. So as such, I know that the, sometimes the political system pushing the direction is like, I am providing a magical solution, no? There are a lot of temptation to do, do, to do that, but I think, um, I, I believe that, you know, uh, good leaders should at this point is like explain to the population there are trade-offs. Uh, I will listen to the scientific evidence in several dimensions, and I will try to come up with the balance, uh, with the balance view. And then the other thing is, take into account incentives. It's like these things that do not work because they are ill-designed in terms of incentives. It's a huge problem, I think. Gustavo, thank you for that. David, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, it's a pleasure. To look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. That would thank be great. you very much, and thanks for all the comments. It was yes. really, I wrote many of the comments. It's, uh, you know, food for thoughts in the, in the future, I think. If you need something, just write us an email or write me an email, yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.